So the question was, see, we started off saying that uh, why uh, take uh, Western culture seriously? Because it began with the question that Balu introduced. You know, uh, how does the world look if we look from our uh, way? Now, from there we have come and why it is important to study uh, Western culture. And we also reversed it, you know, to understand Western culture, how it is important to look at uh, Indian culture. Now, in this comparative project, a lot of issues have been sort of discussed in terms of language, experience, the question of, you know, uh, political theory, all these things have uh, sort of addressed. So in which, for example, of the questions that have been sent, almost 60% of the questions have answers there. Now we can, I mean, they, they have to find them, they're available, they can get back to us, we can get into conversation later. So now in the last part, the question came, okay, so far we under, we, we uh, spend more time thinking about uh, Europe and now let's focus on what Indian texts were talking about this uh, Raja, Varna, Varna Sankara, even some people even have posted this question about uh, this, what is this idea of Iha and Para? I think, I mean, these questions put together brings us to the point where uh, it shows in which direction the research program is going to go further. That is the second part that we wanted to sort of discuss from uh, where pick our thread. So this is what the kind of uh, quick wrap up that I wanted to do so that you know we, we can go in this direction. But before Balu could respond, Srinivasji, you, I think you have been deprived of an opportunity to ask questions. You have a lot of questions. So I think you should flag your questions first and then from there we can uh, go further. Uh uh, so, uh, uh, of course, uh, somebody is pointing out that the question about Raja and Praja needs to be addressed. I'm sure that will be addressed. Uh, but yes, I also wanted to raise one uh, question. Uh, thank you for giving an opportunity. Of course, uh, uh, I could understand uh, the discussion about language and terminology is only to point out that certain words uh, have a, a deeper uh, cultural context and they're more or less like terminology which carry a lot of meaning. And uh, it, it is only being brought to people's consciousness that one has to use those words carefully. And knowledge consists in understanding the cultural context of those words and not just using them as a replacement for something that they understand uh, you know, locally. Uh, so the same holds uh, for Sanskrit terms as well because of the loss of transmission of knowledge and the loss of the context in which uh, the Sanskrit terms were used uh, uh, because of uh, the political social changes that have happened in the country. We have to also pay attention to what the specific words really mean to be able to have access to the knowledge that these words uh, are referring to. Now, this part of it I could understand. But my question is that, uh, so when you're talking about colonial uh, consciousness um, and when you're claiming that there is a, a break in transmission of knowledge, you're surely saying that only for a small section of the people uh, and not the whole population uh, you know, of the country. Um, so you know, what is this colonial consciousness? How does it spread? What is the medium of you know, infecting people? Uh, you know, across the country. Now, um, and when, let's say, the Sringeri Matha says that they've had unbroken transmission of the Guru uh, Parampara, of course, you address this issue in uh, the, uh, the fourth chapter of you know, what it means to be Indian book. Um, so are you claiming that their claim is false, that they don't actually have uh, an unbroken uh, a tradition of uh, a teaching uh, in the Matha? Um, similarly, for those people who have probably never spoken a word of English uh, language in their lives uh, and uh, probably don't deal with the, uh, the politics and day-to-day -day, uh, politics, but are completely within a, a frame of knowledge that they limited, limit themselves to, are you claiming that they're also afflicted by this colonial consciousness? You ask me, you want me to start yeah. the conversation? Okay. First, uh, I want to make a remark about the last two sessions and about the coming session. See, in a way, because it was a retrospective, the last two sessions, 
It meant indicating the different domains and different disciplines we are touching upon or investigating into. There are two ways of doing it. One is to say, try and summarize our results. It faces a difficulty that it's, it's difficult to understand. It's a first difficulty. Second is, it becomes a dry preaching, sermon, lectures. And that is not what we need today because this is a second element to that, prospect. Namely, how do we go forward? So in a way, we have been, at least I have been, for trying to indicate the domains, and in fact, you touched on many domains, but in a light way, that is, trying to make weak attempts at jokes. There's a reason for that, because now I want to shift the discussion to a different level much more serious, not that we are not serious before, much more focused than the last two sessions. Now, it'll become a bit heavy because of that, but it's my hope that the shift in the character level of discussions leaves you only with this idea that there is serious research occurring at multiple domain, in multiple domains, incorporate many dimensions to understand which you have to do some serious work yourself. You will not understand physics or chemistry, physics or all the domains of physics, some domains of physics, by a summary of the story in 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 15 minutes, and so on. All you can hope is to realize how broad, how big, how vast, the domains of knowledge are. And the best way to do it is to lighten it. And that is the first two sessions, because it's prospect. It is retrospective when you look back. So I try to play the role of the grandfather, as what he always looking back and telling how it was in his time. Prospective is about your future. So we're going to go a little bit uh, to another plane. Much more serious, much more focused. I hope you'll be with us. So with this, that is going to give the tone to the how I'm going to answer and respond to Srinivas. Let's begin with the question. Uh, well, let's begin with the following remark. Our research includes colonial consciousness. But there's only one element in, in the research we're doing. It's not the focus or the goal of the research to do research on colonial consciousness. Why do I say it? Because one of the questions that participants raised is to say that our research takes Said's story further. And there were some questions regarding Said's story and our story. Actually, the story has very little to do with science. In fact, almost nothing. We are not telling a story of Orientals. In fact, we have problems with that story. Very serious problems. But say he did something good, some good work in the sense that he tried to show that the way West looked at Arab countries, basically, but today it's all countries, exhibits a certain kind of pattern in this country. He did not say what the pattern in the description was, except say it is Eurocentric, racist, and so on, uh, misogynistic, et cetera, et cetera. And he did not tell us why that pattern comes into existence. He didn't tell us why it sustains itself. He did not tell us how it reproduces itself. He didn't tell us how it expands. In other words, we do not have any knowledge of what Orientalism is, it's just a word. Same thing for things like Eurocentrism. Western social sciences are Eurocentric. What exactly is being talked about? How do you make it what? India centric? I mean, is it possible to say physics is Eurocentric? 
if it is not possible to do that. But it is possible to do that for knowledge about human beings, then it follows necessarily that you cannot have knowledge of human beings. Because knowledge is knowledge. If you have knowledge about human beings, it applies to the Americans, to the Europeans, to the British, to the Africans, to Indians, and so on. So either we have knowledge, in which case, calling it Eurocentric doesn't tell us anything. It's like saying, you know, uh, Einstein's theory uh, emerged in Germany, therefore it's Germanocentric or Eurocentric. No, it could be or defined. So the problem is to, 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 to speak about Orientalism, Eurocentrism, racism, misogynism, sexism is characteristic of Eurocentric discourse. It can get you a job in Columbia University. Sure. But it won't give you any knowledge about human beings. And the first and the most important thing, which in my introduction I spoke about, is that our research is following, tracking now, in the root of now, and develops now, and can be tested exactly the way we just met the science. The only examples we have of knowledge. So, it's important to know this because this is related to the question, what is colonial consciousness? Because people think when I speak of, or when these people, as the research programs speak about colonial consciousness, we're talking about how Indians and colonized subjects experience it, feel, think in the world. No, colonial consciousness is also how colonial masters think experience about the world, which means colonization impacts not just the colonial subjects, it does it in one way, but also colonial masters, which does it in another way. So colonial consciousness in this sense, the what we are talking about, what we are uh, doing research on, is about how colonization affects in a very deep sense Everybody in this world, the masters and the subjects included. So therefore, what is colonial consciousness, if you in simple terms, if you want, is how we in the last three, four hundred years, in different ways, we are looking at the world, describing it, working in it, changing it, experiencing it. And what is the result? Well, all we have to do is look at today's world. 21st century, we have more poverty and hunger than before. After the Second World War, 21st century, the world is full of wars. Suffering is increased. Aggression is increased. Pain is increasing. Poverty is increasing. Disease is increasing. At a time when in the 21st century, we are supposed to be developing knowledge, science, technology, and I don't know what else. Today, how people are reacting and talking about COVID-19 is an example of that. The alternative news, the alternative facts, post-truth world is an example of that. This is for the consciousness. That's what we're living. So instead of, and what, what does it mean? It's in Indian terms, in simple terms. What colonial consciousness has done is this. It has elevated ignorance to the level of knowledge on the one side. And on the other side, done something which we really call a jnana in Indian traditions, which in certain Advaita tradition is called papa, which is, Presenting truth as knowledge. We use the word bullshit. When we use it, we mean that. When truth is presented as knowledge, then you're bullshitting. Why? Because if truth is presented as knowledge, what happens is Truth prevents the emergence of knowledge. It's not a theoretical claim. Take a simple example, my favorite example. 
I suppose you have two. So let's say you send them to universe. Uh, let's say they want to teach you about the anthropology, sociology, whatever, of a people, say India or Belgium. Say take India. And your child is interested, you are interested, and you go and send your child a lot of money to a university like Jane. Now here is what happens in JNU. It's not happening, right? So just I'm giving you an example. So what does a JNU professor do? Uh, urban anthropology. So he'll give you a telephone book of Delhi city and asks your child to memorize and that's exam. Sociology. They give you telephone books of all Indian cities. Make a child learn it, meaning memorize it by heart, exam. And you ask your child, what are you learning? And he says, urban anthropology, a social anthropology in India. So what do you learn there? Well, we are learning memorizing telephone books. Ask yourself the following question. Would you think JNU is teaching knowledge to your child? Would you be willing to pay money for your child to sit and learn telephone books? And practical experience, that's computational word, ICT must be taught. So your children are taught how to produce telephone books. Why would you object? I tell you why you should not have Is not every single statement in a telephone book true? They are teaching your child truths. Why are you objecting? In other words, what do we see there? This is a silly example. But you, if you go deeper, into social sciences, anywhere in the world. This is what they teach. Partial truths, some truths. <coughs> but they're like telephone books. Well, I, we call them factoids. So teaching truth, if that is what we want an education system to do, if truth is so important, well then, this university, Jane, you're teaching telephone book production of telephone books is teaching truth and therefore it's giving knowledge. So if you're for truth, if you say you're searching for truth, surely that must sense right. But it doesn't. Sad as there's nobody in fact. So raise the next question. Is search for truth important or not? Satyan Vaishan, searching for truth. Here's a strange, look at the strange situation in that. If you look at the television and read the newspapers, in two countries, at least in two countries in the world, a top leadership is described as maniacal liars. Donald Trump, there is called a fat chicken machine. No, not for the machine, fact checking human being. Every day following the tweets of Donald Trump to note, to note down how many lies he has told. He is the, one of the greatest liars on earth. Boris Johnson is no different. Exactly the same. Everybody, call, I'm not calling it, they're saying it. They are liars. They continuously tell the truth, uh, lies. They don't tell the truth. So two cultures, you see, two countries, part of the Western culture, which says truth is most important thing on earth, elects, supports, enjoys absolute liars as a political leadership. So much so, that the dictionary is talk about a post-truth world. That's not part of it. 
dictionary, Oxford English Dictionary. Alternative facts, alternative news, fake news. Well, nobody seems to have a problem. Because if you do, in America, you are a Democrat anti-Trump. You have it in England, that's because you're anti-Johnson, anti-conservatives, you're with the Labour. How come the population is not shocked by this? That lying is the most supreme value in a culture which claims, Western culture, this is not limited to England and the, or America, which claims we must search for truth, science search for truth. What is going on? What is it that we want our children to learn when they send them to schools and colleges? Learn truth. Everybody today in India more and more talks about Satya Anvesha, Satya Me Vajayate, and so on and so on and so on. But actually, in our languages, if you look carefully, that's not what we want. Jnanarjane. We want knowledge. What are you doing? I'm searching for jnana, not for truth. Not for truth. Because what is truth? Sentences about the world. That's true. That's the only thing I mean, true or false. Science is not a set of true sentences. Please take a scientific theory and see how many true sentences exist. Simple, simple theory. Even go to Euclid's geometry, which you have learned in school. Take a theorem, look at the proofs, and tell me how many true sentences there are in that theorem. So, physics, same thing, logic, same thing. So, so any science we go to, it doesn't consist of sentences which are true. How the sentences are not understandable if you don't have the technical definitions and theorems proved and iterations of the theorems. You want to understand? This is not One step, I'm going to answer the question. I'm taking one step back. A search for truth is so important. Supreme value, according to all philosophers, yeah. We value truth. Epistemic value of truth. Nobody, no philosopher asks the question, why do you believe in truth? Except one fellow, poor guy, Nietzsche, he went crazy. He asked, why truth? Why not untruth? But it doesn't matter, forget Nietzsche. If you say, why do you believe in it? It's true. Ah, yeah, that's okay. As it's a reason to believe. Now, there's no justification required. If it's true, it's fine. It is the ultimate justification for accepting some statement as about being a being about the world. But there is a state, state. If you know the Bible, especially the New Testament Bible, the Gospels, Roman prefect Pilatus, or Pilate, as you call it, asked a very strange question to Jesus of Nazareth. The question was, what is true? Wait for one second. Think. Pilate is an intelligent man, administrator. He knows two plus two is equal to four. He knew that Rome had an emperor. So he knew, therefore, if somebody were to come and uh, the Jews had no king. If somebody had come and told Pilate, Pilatus that two plus two is equal to four, he would say, ah, what rubbish. That's not true, he would have said. In that case, why did he ask the question, what is true to Jesus? And read Jesus' response. Go to the Bible and take a look at it. What, what was Pilate trying to say? What were they talking about? Because you see, in Christianity, Judaism, Islam, 
the Semitic religions. Don't call them Abrahamic religions, please. They are Semitic religions. <clears throat> God is the truth. So searching for truth is important. Only value to human beings, because the only reason to exist on earth is to seek God, Christian God, Jewish God, Muslim God, or biblical God. So searching for truth was important and primary because of that. So truth has a value because of that. And when Christianity begins to go backward in a culture, like it is the case today, the idea of truth is important remains, but it's of no significance. Look at UK, look at USA, look at Europe. Liars or elected, unpopular, not true, whatever that might mean. So when you're there for 10 years trying to train you to teach telephone books, you would be right in saying, look, I'm not sending my children to learn truth. I'm teaching, I'm sending them to have knowledge. That is India. That's Indian culture. Not true. And as I said, I think in the chapters, you must realize we are supposed to have 33,000 crore gods. And I always wonder who the hell counted it. But let's say somebody did count 33,000 crore. Let's say we have them. So the god for almost the uh, devatas, and so for everything. But there is no god or god, it's a true. Well, for, but for knowledge, Saraswati. Not God and Goddess and truth. We don't have it. For knowledge, yes. What do we respect? Knowledge. So there is no Satyanvation. That's Bakwas. There is Gyananti. Search for knowledge. Now, why is this important? Well, let's go back to JNU example. What is preventing? Your child from learning knowledge, truth, telephones, true statements. Just set of true statements in geography doesn't teach your child about geography at all. That is why we are taught to learn things by heart. Colonial consciousness to answer Sri Nath's question has, among other things, this subordinate knowledge to truth. Subordinate. India, it's the other way around. Truth is subordinated to knowledge. Knowledge is always true. But not everything that's true is knowledge. We know that from experience. But everything that's knowledge is true. There can be no such thing as false knowledge. But truth is not always knowledge. Not every truth is knowledge. Therefore, Indian culture said, we seek knowledge. And they realized, and they saw that, whereas ignorance is the precondition for truth, for learning, for knowledge, truth will block the emergence of knowledge if truth is presented as knowledge. If telephone guide is presented as knowledge to a student, you will pull your child out of that university, top elite university, because that's not knowledge. Truth, preventing knowledge is what we call bullshit, milder term in Hindi, bakwas. And that is what is dominant in colonial consciousness. So, that is why, when they write about India, when they write about Europe, we talk so much bakwas. It is not a question of meaning of words. It's not a question of technical words. There are words in, let's use the word, theories about the world, about human beings, that is a part of knowledge. Issue is not one of translation of those words. Issue is one of acquiring that knowledge. 
So the tragedy of the last 300, 400 years of colonialism is in colonial world, truth begins to block more and more emergence of knowledge. Truth is presented as knowledge. Colonial subjects, amongst other things, we come and tell in our universities, we tell this bakas. Go to sociology department, go to philosophy department, go to any social science department, ethics. In India, Bakwas is sold as knowledge. One more example before I round off the answer to that question. Consider. We think we all know what ethics and morality is, right? Intuitively, at least. We think we know. We think we know what, for example, otherwise we wouldn't speak about justice, injustice, justice, social justice. We wouldn't be speaking about that. Moral, immoral, we wouldn't be speaking about. We think we know all these things. And in fact, we think we know what it means in English and in German and in French and in Dutch. And Now, what philosophers and moralists, especially logicians, have done in the last 25 years is this. What exactly, when do we recognize a statement as an ethical or a moral statement? They said, when we use the word ought, moral ought, it is a moral statement. It's a value statement. So the next step was, all right, what is art? What are its logical and semantic properties of this art? So there is a huge domain, very interesting, called deontic logic. Deontic referring to means one of the meanings of it is moral or ethical. So logic of ethics, logic of morality, deontic logic. And they started analyzing the properties of words like you, it is forbidden, you, it is recommended. You, it is compulsory or obligatory. So what are the properties of these words? And to have developed, today there is a consensus about it, 40 years of research. Why is this important to us? Suppose you come with that to look at Indian languages. Sanskrit to Bhojpuri. We discover something very, 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 very strange. There is no way on earth, not just in India, so all of Asia, can, are we able to express the following statement. You ought not to kill. Moral ought. They cannot say it. How will we say it? You should not kill. How do we know that? Very simple. Take two sentences. You should not drink that water. It's not ought. It says you should not because you're going to get sick. You should not, you and you should not kill. Sentences are exactly the same. You cannot differentiate. There's no way of differentiating. You should not sleep with your head to the north, I was told as a child, because if you do, Ganesha is still looking for a human head. Okay, because he's got an elephant head, so you sleep with your head to the north, they cut it off and he'll take us. So don't sleep with your head to the north. I believed it, of course. You should not sleep. Same sentence. You should not drink the glass of water. You should not kill. You should respect your parents. Every single, I don't know many Indian languages. I know about five, six. I don't know many Asian languages. In fact, I hardly outside of India, I don't know uh, any Asian language because when I speak in Chinese, nobody understands it except myself. So that apart, here is my claim. Not one single Asian language, including Indian, would be able to say the following sentence. You ought not to kill. You should not drink water. Two different sentences, impossible. What follows from that? We cannot talk about ethics and morality the way Europeans, Muslims, and the Jews speak. We cannot. Linguistically, it's not possible. 
And that is why the British said Indians are immoral. Because they didn't find any such sentences in our text. Does it mean we have no ethics? Of course not. What does it mean then? It means what we think ethics and morality today, what are genuine intellectuals and St. Stephen intellectuals and newspaper people write about and so on, they're using English language without understanding what it means. You will not understand moral art unless and until you do a deep study of deontic logic, then you see it as a formal concept, but you can't apply it to your actions. In your language, you can't, so you don't understand. And yet to come across an Indian who is able to understand properly an ethical text, including the best ethical thinkers India has produced, whether it is a Pratabhanu Mehta or somebody else, they don't understand. It's not, there's nothing wrong with it. Brilliant people, intelligent people, nice people. But a language doesn't, because why doesn't a language allow it? That's not our experience. That's not how we talk about our things. We talk in a different way about our things. This moral art, where does that come from? The God who is outside in space and time. Following his commands is what it means to be ethical. We, our gods, whatever the, the gods are not, they're all in this cosmos. They're not outside space and time. And they do not command us. Nobody commands. And that is why everybody found our gods very immoral. Imagine Krishna, yeah? 16,000 women. If you're scientifically minded, sit down and calculate. How many times should you sleep with, that, with a woman? Same woman, 16,000. How many times should you sleep? How many orgasms? For how many days? You'll be shocked by the discovery. Oh my God. Is it possible? Krishna is a liar. He lied. It, he's, a, he's a thief. Steals butter. Tells lies to his mother. Have you, have you eaten the butter, Krishna? I look at my mouth and gives Vishwarupa Darshana. So poor Yashoda is totally flipped. She doesn't know what the hell is going on. She has forgotten her question whether he stole butter or not. I also would be. I mean, I, what the hell? So, our God, whoever it is, Shiva, Ishwara, Vishnu, Brahma is an embodiment. But who is Saraswati? These are Adevatas. And how did they describe Adevatas? Immoral. It's not that we didn't know that. You know how I was taught? Hey, this is how God's devata, devas behave. So human beings should not imitate them. That's how I was taught. In this Semitic religion, with the God outside space time, God is perfectly ethical, perfectly moral. Therefore, Obeying his commandments is to be ethical and moral. That's the language of ethics and morality of the last 2,000 years, before Aristotle, after Aristotle, and so on. But we use it. We write tracts. We write articles. We teach our children that in schools and colleges and universities. But we don't know what we're talking about. It is not possible to know that. What are we teaching students? Bakwas or Western ethics? This is colonial culture. True trumps knowledge. In us, truth is subordinated to knowledge. True what you want. Choose truth. You see what the world has, what's happened to the world in the last 400 years. Even before that, in the, middle, in the medieval Europe as well. Truth, knowledge. So you choose knowledge. Well, that's what Buddha tried to do. That's what Shankara tries to do. That's what the Upanishads tried to do. A Veda means not esoteric knowledge. People, there is no such thing as esoteric knowledge. Knowledge must be present. Knowledge should be capable of being tested. Knowledge must be capable of being understood. There can be no such thing as knowledge. 
supramundane knowledge, not possible. If it's knowledge, it's not possible. There is no supramundane physics or esoteric physics. Even metaphysics is not esoteric. This is where we are. This, if we want to go further, break away from colonial consciousness. Some people have raised the question, how do you do it? There is only one possibility, which is what Indians discovered 3,000 years ago and continue for at least one and a half thousand years later, further. How do you get out of this? Only through knowledge. That means follow the route which would lead you, which could lead you to knowledge, which would lead you to knowledge. Therefore, I began today's talk by saying, if you look back at the route I have taken, I said, it is following the route that knowledge should take. And I said, if you want to judge what other people are saying, including me, use those criteria. Because if not salvation, let's left for special souls who obey the biblical God, not to us, a moksha is not salvation in any sense of the word. So if you want that, Test what you're told about India, Indian culture, Indian people, not just them. Because I said, ask any question about who is India, who, what it means to be, what it, what it is to be an Indian, will give us a surprising answer in so, by laying the foundation of social science. So, knowledge is the only possibility they have. Not just you and me and Indians, all of us, humankind, is the only route to break out of colonial There are other aspects that he is raising. What about people who don't have English education and so on? That will take us to a different aspect. That is namely for the only consciousness of the colonized. We'll talk about it if it is necessary. But first get the general picture. Colonial consciousness is ignorance, preventing emergence of knowledge, truth parading as knowledge. And the only way out of it is through knowledge. Anybody wants to add anything here? I, I just wanted to add another small element uh, of the uh, question that Srinivas Ji has raised. He has taken the example of Shrungeri Matha, and mm -hmm. uh, these are, uh, what to say, pure form of transmission, etc. See, I can't comment about Shrungeri Matha because I don't know about the Shrungeri Patshala. But I wanted to actually outline some general picture of the kind of ignorance that we have about what Islamic colonialism has done to us and what are its repercussions. And I would go back to one of the uh, sort of less uh, studied essays of Sheldon Pollock. So what Sheldon Pollock does is that he had a project on uh, Indian knowledge systems. And he uh, gets the survey of number of domains, starting from, you know, <clears throat> various disciplines like Dharma Shastra to Mimamsa to Jyotishya. He takes eight different domains and he looks at the number of influential texts that have been produced between 10th century to 15th century and 15th century onwards. And it's interesting in these eight domains that he conducts the survey, there is hardly any significant text that comes, even in domains like Mimamsa, etc., etc., for 500 years, there is absolute dark, no new text in these disciplines. In fact, he goes on to say, for example, people like Appaya Dikshita, when he comes back and picks up certain writing on Mimams, so he had to start from where it was stopped at 10th century. So there is this question, what happened in that 500 years and why nothing has been produced in the domains that he has been sketching? I mean, now we have more information because some of the students who deal with Balu, for instance, they looked at the text in the domain of Vakarna. See, one of the important things that they were recognizing is between 10th century to 13th century, if you look at the texts of Vakarna, the kind of issues, the kind of themes, the kind of arguments that comes, they're completely different. One could see the nature of the text themselves being different, not in Vakarna, now they're coming up with more and more an example uh, with this. So this is exactly the period where Islam had a huge impact on India. Now, one of the most important part that has happened for that period in time, and India certainly, you know, Islamic colonialism has damaged 
the nature of transmission. And it also has brought in certain elements that Balu was just pointing out, that these new ways of talking about, you know, uh, say, for example, the obsession towards, so suddenly we all now talk about Krupa as some positive term. And there is also another way of talking about, say, Satyanveshane comes into being by 16th century, people start talking about Satyanveshane. There is completely new way of talking by our ancestors by 15th, 16th century, 13th century, it started emerging. So there is something extraordinary that has happened in the period of 500 years. And we seem to be absolutely ignorant. So when people respond to Balu, uh, when he writes about Manu or anything else, they say, ah, he has not taken into consideration the commentators. But there is a huge damage that was already beginning to emerge in that period that has not been noticed. So the quick summary of what I wanted to say is that even though one would want to say that there are things, for example, Vedapata has been transmitted, Ghana, Jata. I mean, there is some way that some people has retained it. I mean, there has been some traditions which have been uh, continuing. That does not necessarily guarantee that our uh, you know, traditions have been transmitting uninterrupted without any changes, the traditions in the same way that was existing, you know, you know, 1000 years before. So this is something that we need to, you don't need to buy mystery, you have to just go and do a survey of the material available in front of us. Think about it very seriously. Automatically, it becomes glaringly visible. So that's what I wanted to add it up to the story of what Balu has just now said. In a slightly lighter way, but equally seriously. Think about this famous shloka of Manu. Satyam bruyat, priyam bruyat, na bruyat, satyam apriyam, priyam cha, nanutam bruyat, eshadhanam sanatam. Look at the first two sentences. Satyam bruyat, priyam bruyat. Strange. Whatever that Priyam, what Priyam, leave it at that. But look at it. If you tell truth, in some sense it must be pleasing, not psychologically pleasing, not flattering. That's not, that's not what Manu is talking about. But why is that important? Truth has a goal. Why tell truth is an important question in the Indian tradition. That's why he can say, Nabruya Satyamapriya, that means shut up. That's not what he is saying. Priyam Chanandutam Ruya, that's just because somebody likes it, don't go lying. Oh. But first part, Satyam Bruya, Priyam Bruya. But nobody has said that about Gyan. As somebody was just making, Nahi Jnani Nesadrisham, it comes in, in, comes in Gita. Meaning what? There's nothing that we can see like knowledge. Not true. Knowledge. Nothing like that. And that's why to this day, I was talking to some of my Sanskrit friends the other day. See if, if this thing will also appeal to you. Just for a moment, uh, take away your moral revulsion or ethical revulsion about atyachara on women. Just, just forget that for a minute. Just for a second. Okay. Now, you hear somebody say there was atyachara on Lakshmi. Meaning? He just used the money to drink, to play, gamble. That's absolute atyachala and Lakshmi. And Lakshmi is called Tanchala. She sleeps with many men. Never can she go some. That's one of the properties of Lakshmi. The goddess of wealth. So, say, you will never say to somebody who's, let's say, uh, miss uh, spending money or that crazy fellow, you don't say, you're doing atyachala to Lakshmi. You don't say that. All right. How about Atyachara Parvati? Actually, we don't know what it would mean. Atyachara Parvati, what does it consist of? Don't know. We just don't know. But begin with the smaller one. If you're brought up as, a, as an Indian, you're doing Apachara to Saraswati. Oh, what? Suppose you go one step further. 
That is Atyachara on Saraswati. You are absolutely shattered. Not because it's Atyachara. Tri, Lakshmi, Parvati, Saraswati. Saraswati, even Apachara, we can't tolerate. Especially those who have been brought up. Go and ask those, children, those students who have been brought up in Gurukala, for example. The best, the, the, the best way to, 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 to make them feel terrible is you doing Apachara to Saraswati. They, they, they don't know what to do. They won't even use the word Atyachara, but if you use it, it's the most horrible thing they can do. That is because what Saraswati is. She is the body of knowledge. That's why as children, we don't do it anymore in India, perhaps the way I was brought up. If by accident my feet touched a piece of paper or it, it stepped on newspaper, we do that. I mean, I, I was taught that. You know, sometimes when I'm in India, I do that. And they say, what the hell am I doing? That's my whole thing. I've been brought up that way. But disrespect, this love, this affection, this veneration is only for knowledge, nothing else. Not for wealth, not for political power, not for status, not for anything. That's why when we say that man is a jnani, you respect. Vidvamsa, I am not so sure. Pandita, you must be careful. That's why you also distinguish between a pandita and a guru. But the point I want to make to you is simply this. This is what knowledge is in our culture. Not truth, knowledge. So look at your own experience. This is to relate to language, knowledge, and experience. Look at the way. Look at the way you talk. Look at the way you've been brought up. And imagine, don't forget one thing when you think of Sarasvati. Daughter of Brahma. And Brahma has an incestuous relationship to Saraswati, but plays absolutely no role. We know that. But it plays no role at all. Not because incest is a good thing in India. Father sleeping with a daughter is the best thing. Nobody says that. Nobody does. Well, not nobody does it. I'm sure there are some people who do it. Oh, fine. But Saraswati, when you look at Saraswati, these are not the associations that are made, even though we know the story. No. You touch paper, you step on paper with your feet, with your foot, you do this. Sometimes you even go and touch the paper and do it. Hey, Saraswati, I say you can't step on her. That's how we used to talk. This is Saraswati. This is, because it's knowledge. She's bodied of knowledge. Second, you can control Lakshmi if you're a very rich man. Vishnu can direct Lakshmi. And as told, not just Vishnu, others. Parvati is the same thing. But what is forbidden, what is unthinkable in Indian tradition is that you can control Saraswati. You can have authority over Saraswati. Not possible. Not possible. Any other word is possible. This one, impossible. This is knowledge to us. Question for colonial consciousness is this. Why have we given this up so quickly, so easily? And what is it you're teaching when we teach our children in universities, which is a jnana mandira, allegedly? What do we teach? Jnana? I don't know if jnana must teach Bhagavad Gita, yeah? Physics is jnana also. So is mathematics, so is biology, so is genetics, and so on and so on and so on. This is India, this is our culture. And we are not there. This is what has been in some senses transmitted. So there's been only damage in transmission. It doesn't fully answer your question, Srinivas. These are all dimensions of what is colonial consciousness with respect to the West, with respect to us. Both suffer from colonial consciousness.